Aloha, this is Hamza Rifa Hussain. You're watching Islamabad today for Think Tech Hawaii. Today's topic is Hunar Kata, celebrations of a dehumanized existence. Now, this topic might sound very complicated, but it's not. It's all about the power of art. I have with me a veteran actor who is also a veteran artist for that matter, and he's going to be providing us insights on what the concept is all about, his experience of working in the film industry as well as the drama industry, and his experience of working in some of the best institutions of performing arts in the country. So I'm joined by artist and cultural activist and a veteran cultural activist at that, Mr. Jamal Shah. Mr. Jamal Shah, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you very much, Hamza. Thanks for inviting me. Well, it's great to have you here with us, sir. Now, tell us about celebrations of a dehumanized existence. I mean, we're talking about the vivid artwork that you've managed to come up with, and it actually deals with socio-political themes. So what was the message that you were trying to convey, and how does your work relate to social political realities? Well, Hamza, but dehumanization is uh, never celebrated. It's a paradox, but uh, I mean, uh, it has a shock value. and. Uh, as an individual brought and bred in Pakistan, I've always felt that, uh, you know, as the Chinese uh, curse say, may you live in interesting times. We've been living in interesting times uh, ever since, and uh, um, uh, we've been governed by self-imposed decision makers, uh, which is... Uh, <clears throat> The reason that, uh, you know, themes such as this one occur into people's mind. I personally feel that uh, art is uh, the most effective means of communication. And it's a force that can engage an individual with life very intimately, thereby enables the individual to get intimately informed about things, whether it's the contradictions of your society, the strengths of your Society, your struggles, your nightmares, uh, whatever. And in the process, you become aware of uh, this uh, uh, enviable cultural heritage that you are the custodian of. So, <clears throat> living in a situation like I've always felt that, you know, our people have been studied and robustly for political engagement uh, because our uh, you know electoral system is deeply flawed which encourages only the the rich and the connected uh, to get to the parliament uh, house to become legislators so we have been uh, our lives have been governed by uh, these uh, legislators who have been handpicked by uh, forces that to me, are very, very exploitative. That's why my work uh, is very critical, because I have chosen to uh, remain critically engaged with life. If you're critically engaged with life, then you see a lot of, uh, you know, ill happening around you. So I cannot ignore it. Therefore, it reflects in my art. And my recent work, which is, uh, uh, you've seen the images, these are Morgas. You are from Pakistan, you know uh, what a morga is yes. when we were children. We used to disobey the master or the teacher in the class. Uh, he would order us to become morga, uh, which means to you know transform ourselves into a very, very painful uh, posture uh, that is not only painful but also very, very insulting. So I see my entire nation as morgas. Uh, but Morgaz, the difference because these Morgaz are very, very colorful. And it seems as though they are very happy with their existence uh, despite all the misery and pain and everything. And they are unable to stand up and uh, try and change their, uh, their surroundings. So that is the message. And uh, uh, celebration of dehumanization is, uh, as I said, it's a paradox. It can never happen. But in Pakistan, it seems that uh, we witness it uh, uh, every day in our lives. And the message is for people to get up and try and change their uh, fate. Well, it's a message which is desperately needed in Pakistan, particularly in you know contemporary times where 
there's high unemployment, uh, there are severe economic problems. So the message should be well taken by everyone who has come across Mr. Jamaftar's work. So you founded the Hunar Kada College of Visual and Performing Arts and was also the you know executive director of the PNCA till 2019. Tell us about both institutions and their contributions to the performing arts industry. Well, Hamza, when I uh, graduated from National College of Arts, I went back to my hometown, Quetta, to set up the fine arts department in Baluchistan University. Taught there and headed the department for uh, three and a half years. Then I got a scholarship to study art in the UK, Slave School of Art. I went there, studied uh, art, and came back with a mission that uh, I'll set up an art school simply because, uh, um, you know, I was totally disgusted with the, uh, with the repeated regimes who were never interested in promoting uh, art and culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I thought uh, I, know I should at least uh, uh, do my bit. So I set up this uh, art school, which is the first and still only uh, truly not-for-profit non-governmental art school. The idea was to try and promote and propagate art with a uh, with the intention that art can be and always is uh, uh, you know an agent of change. Uh, the art that uh, the pedagogy of art that focuses on social change. Uh, so that's what we do at Unakada. As for uh, PNCA, I was hired by PNC in 2007 because there, there was a crisis and they wanted me my input. I spent one year there and I came back. And then in 2016, they wanted me again. They offered me a three-year co- uh, contract. And they said that you can transform uh, the, uh, the institution because you are... Um, involved in both uh, visual and performing arts and yeah. uh, we need your input i joined the uh, institution with great hopes that uh, i'll be able to you know turn pnc into a truly autonomous uh, institution of art because that is what is needed because institutions like pncs can never be run by the governments uh, i spent 3 years there and i uh, tried to uh, you know <clears throat> Uh, change the structure of PNCA, but I have failed miserably. But still, you know, during these three years, I uh, gave them very good programming and some very, very consequential uh, ideas, such as uh, uh, the you know one was able to uh, introduce uh, or to convince the government to adopt the first cultural policy of Pakistan. That happened during my tenure. And then I did a very big program called CPAC Cultural Karwa, where uh, 12 Pakistani and 12 Chinese artists started their journey from Xi'an, which is the oldest capital of China. And they're looking at different nodal points and interacting with local artists and uh, doing trans- uh, transformative works. So that, that, that was a very successful project because it dealt with both visual arts and performing arts, music, theater, dance, cinema, etc., etc. And it was well. very well received. Dramas as well. Sorry? Dramas as well. Yeah, dramas as well. Of course, theater. Mm-hmm. Um, that was very successful and uh, I remained there for three years. They wanted uh they, they offered the extension but i didn't want to continue because uh, i had other better things to do so that's what i did in pnc and that's uh, what i'm doing at uh, unarkada uh, mm-hmm. right now fantastic so author dr rahat navid masood in a review of celebrations of a dehumanized existence she states that there is a deep connection between art and politics in your work. Now, you mentioned this already in the first question, but when we talk about this connection between art and politics, uh, how would you define that? Well, Hamza, art can never be apolitical because for any conceptual artist throughout the history, whether it is Michelangelo, Caravaggio, or uh, Van Gogh, or Corbet, 
myself, Goya, Picasso, etc., etc. All of them were uh, people who had a very keen eye. Um, they were they were engaged deeply with the the concerns of uh, the time. Uh, whether that was Da Vinci or Michelangelo or whatever, they, they do what the politics of the etc. So you need you have to be uh, to begin with an aware person, an aware individual of society, and also concerned. So if you are concerned and uh, you are also aware and you believe in uh, in uh, transforming this life into an exi uh, aesthetic existence. Then you are bound to uh, include everything you, in your art. Your art doesn't remain uh, just entertainment or beautification of walls or uh, squares or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It uh, embodies messages which are uh, focused on the betterment of society. Because uh, I would like to live in a situation where everybody uh, benefits from similar. Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, what would I say? Um, concerns and you know uh, facilities and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. What I mean is that there should be equality. Right. Only that can bring harmony in your life, and uh, people can be happy. I mean, it will. Uh, it is. Uh, uh, very disturbing to see that uh, uh, sitting in my studio, I can uh, enjoy life at a very, very luxurious level. But outside my studio, there's poverty, there's misery, there's everything else. So that is not on. And you think that art can bridge such social equities or inequities, if I would like to say, uh, to the point where you could actually see a more egalitarian society? You think art can play that role if that message is actually portrayed? Hamza, well, I... I think I think art has the power uh, which uh, enables an individual to uh, get engaged with life very very intimately, and it's that uh, intimacy that informs you about uh, your past, your present, your struggles, your achievements, your nightmares, and everything. And you become an aware person. As you attain awareness, you become brave. As you become brave, you become uh, interested in sharing. You start being stingy. So when you become a productive being, then you 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 are bound to become a, an agent of change. Right. And all your energies are focused on uh, trying to bring about positive changes in society, which can beautify life, which can make your surroundings into a better place for living. Mm -hmm. So let's come so to art. Does that, of course, it definitely does, and uh, the message has to be portrayed in a very impactful manner. And your artwork has definitely done that. So tell us about the 1989 British television serial Traffic that was nominated for six British Academy Awards and won three of them. What was the message uh, in that particular television series, and how was your experience working in it? I think uh, I was very fortunate to have been selected. Uh, for the part that I played, Fazal, who was the poppy grower, mm -hmm. uh, they interviewed about 300 uh, individuals in Pakistan for that part. And I was the lucky and the blessed uh, who got this part. And I, working with the crew of Traffic and uh, Alastair Reed, who was the director, it was through and through a learning process. I learned a lot. And Traffic itself, the content was very, very authentic because it dealt with the uh, uh, the situation, uh, you know, that was the reflection or reaction or uh, product of uh, Afghan jihad, the so-called jihad, which never was a jihad, where heroin was used as a, as a weapon, not only uh, by the by the militants to get money, but uh, by uh, the other forces to depoliticize. Uh, the 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 youth in Pakistan and of course in Afghanistan. But since uh, I'm concerned with Pakistan, I know that uh, there were many many brilliant uh, friends of mine who became heroin addicts and they lost their lives. So the content was about the 
drug trail of uh, heroin from this part of the world to uh, Europe, which is UK and Germany. And uh, I was uh, uh, sharing screen space with uh, great actors. I uh, worked under a great director. And it was a beautiful opportunity for me. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I learned a lot. And it opened uh, uh, gateways for me as an actor. They thought while acting, the director and others would share, say that uh, you are next to Omar Sharif. Okay. Um, anyways, when I did this, the then there were many other offers. Sorry? That's quite a compliment, by the way. It was a com compliment, of course. Omar uh, um, Sharif was a great actor and uh, my favorite too. Uh, but traffic became... Uh, uh, you know, a, a very uh, uh, effective introduction for me in the world of uh, cinema. And I got many, many offers, which were great. Uh, but some of them I had to refuse because those uh, parts, which were great parts, had uh, uh, detailed uh, sex scenes in them. And uh, I told my, my agent, Gene Diamond, the gene now I love this part, but if I did this part, I won't be able to enter my hometown quota. And not only my uh, uh, my immediate family will be scandalized, but my entire clan will be scandalized because of this part. So, uh, um, unfortunately, I won't be able to do such parts. So please give me parts which are safer. So then I got a few safe parts in. Uh, in a Hollywood film called K2, and some other films were offer, uh, offered to me, and I had agreed to doing that, but uh, they never took off. And then later, in 2016, I, I um, directed my own film, uh, Revenge of the Worthless, which is uh, based on the siege of Swat by the Taliban in 2009. That was, uh, if you... Uh, see this film, you'll realize that uh, this is perhaps one of the most detailed and objective uh, account of uh, the menace of Taliban. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And the SWAT operation is pretty much vivid in everyone's uh, memory, living memory for that matter. And it's a great thing that Pakistan has managed to overcome the terrorism menace in that valley specifically. And it's hoped that uh, terrorism is uh, overcome across the country. So, Mr. Jamal, which script or series do you believe stands out in terms of sending a strong, meaningful message to the society in your illustrious career? And what are the major takeaways that should be highlighted in Ideal Script? I think uh, traffic is one of them. And then, uh, uh, you know, in Pakistan, some of my television plays called Pale Shah, Tapesh, Kinare, these were the productions which had, uh, you know, uh, the content was very, very meaningful because it was reflecting the ethos of uh, uh, our people, the, the problems of our society. Uh, and uh, I was satisfied that I'm not uh, uh, just entertaining people uh, through my part that I'm playing or through this content that I'm part of. Um, also communicating with our people and perhaps, you know, initiating a dialogue with, with society. So these were the parts that uh, the, the scripts uh, that were very, very good be simply because of their authentic authenticity and relevance mm -hmm. uh, to our society, to our, to our problems and the dichotomies of our time. Okay. So uh, when we talk about dichotomies of our time, Pakistan is today in a state of flux, in a state of chaos. The economy is tanking. Social injustices have become more pronounced and they're taking place. Uh, there's also widespread discontent from you know, the majority of the population which lives in poverty. As a highly acclaimed activist yourself, now uh, I've spoken to Jamal Shah, the actor, now I want to speak to Jamal Shah, the activist. Uh, where do you think the problem lies? Well, unless and until we are able to you know, send uh, true representatives of society to the houses of legislation, which are parliament and senate, etc. Et uh, things will not change because the the lot that we get now are totally compromised. 
they are either the elite of the society, the rich of the society, or the well-connected, uh, uh, you know, electables uh, who are not concerned at all about so the, the the contradictions or the miseries of the uh, society or the miseries of the people. These are the people who, when they enter the the parliament house, they they enter in a showcase with a name tag and prize that this is our prize and you can buy us. So these are totally um, compromised people. And it's because of them that there is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, economic uh, disparity in Pakistan. There's joblessness, there's discontent. Uh, I think... In Pakistan, we have to uh, change the system uh, and transform it into a system which uh, respects the constitution of Pakistan. At the moment, the, the institutions, the salaried people of Pakistan have become the decision makers who are uh, otherwise uh, they don't have any business to do that. But the, the, the so-called elected uh, Elite or the compromised elite are just cronies of these uh, salaried uh, officers in different, uh, you know, uh, departments of Pakistan. Do you think Jean Jacques Rousseau's concept of popular sovereignty should reign supreme? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. We need a we need a revolution, but re revolution doesn't come, uh, uh, you know, like a hailstorm. You have to work for it. You have to. Educate your people, like the education, the, the, the revolution of uh, Chairman Mao and so many other people. You know, you need sincere people like Nelson Mandela, who are the lovers of uh, uh, your style and the lovers of people, not the selfish, self-centered elite um, who have been brought uh, by, by the so-called uh, uh, establishment. Uh -huh. The powers And there's so many people. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Finally, Mr. Jamal, what is your message for young artists, aspiring actors and activists who are living through tumultuous times to make something out of themselves? I mean, there are plenty of young artists or aspiring artists out there and actors who don't necessarily get a chance uh, to you know, showcase their talent. So what would your message of motivation be for them and how can they really polish their careers? Well, Hamza, I try not to give sermons to to our youngsters because the youngsters are very energetic. Uh -huh. They just need to get connected with the realities of time. They should become uh, aware of their, uh, their challenges, their potential, their problems. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, start working with the commitment that their work is going to transform the society. Uh, I think our youngsters are very, very talented and I have all the hope and optimism that they'll turn around Pakistan into a much better place uh, to exist. Thank you so much, Mr. Jamal Shah. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank That's you. all from me, Hamza Rifat, for Islamabad today on Think Tech Hawaii. You can follow us on our social media pages for all the latest updates. Until next time, take care.